Good, thank you. So this is a, a nonfiction book, and I, the scene I want to read is really, I think, an early, very early spark of the civil rights movement. It takes place during World War II at a segregated naval base called Port Chicago. All the officers were white, but all the sailors working there were black. They were not permitted to serve on ships, but were given this job of loading bombs and ammunition. And all I need to, to say to set it up is that there had just been a huge explosion on one of these ships. The sailors were given no training in handling bombs. And more than 300 young men were killed. And these, many of them were teenagers. And the, the characters I follow survived this blast, picked up the bodies, sometimes parts of bodies from the bay, and knew that they were going to be put back to work doing the same thing in the same way. And it led to this moment. And one of the characters I mentioned is Joe Small, who was one of the young black sailors. And the Navy later essentially accused him of being the ringleader of what they charge was a mutiny, the largest mutiny in the history of the Navy. The next day, August 9th, 1944, the men of Joe Small's division were sent to lunch early. At 11.15, Lieutenant DeLuke stepped into a small office on the base and picked up a microphone. Division 4, turn out for work, he announced into the mic. DeLuke then walked toward Barrack C, where his men were quartered. As he crossed the base, he could see down to the pier on the opposite side of a narrow river. Docked at the pier was the USS Sangay, a large, empty ammunition ship. As Zaluki strolled up to the barracks, the sailors in their dungarees and blue work shirts were coming out of the building. Many of the men still wore bandages on their arms and faces from the explosion. They lined up slowly, too slowly, for the lieutenant. He stepped up to his chief petty officer, Elmer Boyer, and told Boyer to hurry the men into formation. Sailors from other divisions stood outside the barracks, chatting, smoking cigarettes, it's possible they were out there simply because there was no smoking allowed in the barracks. Or maybe they suspected something interesting was about to happen and wanted to watch. Okay, move them out, DeLuke ordered Boyer when the men were ready. Right face, shouted Boyer, forward march. The division marched in ranks toward the river. As always, Joe Small marched on the left side of the men calling cadence. The group soon approached a T-shaped turn in the road. The path to the right led to the parade ground. The path to the left led down to the ferry which crossed the river to the loading dock. A turn to the right meant another day of routine exercise. A turn to the left meant loading ammunition. Column left, DeLuke ordered Boyer. Column left, Boyer shouted. And then came one of those seemingly small moments that winds up changing the course of history. Someone in the ranks stopped. Or maybe many of the men stopped at once. Different men remembered it differently. Either way, the marching sailors banged together and came to a stop in the road. Men were looking around. Some seemed confused. DeLuke turned to his division. Will you go back to work, he demanded, stepping toward them. No one answered. You're going to load this ship, he told the men, pointing across the water. Percy Robbins heard, heard someone near him mutter, Oh, no, we ain't. We're not going to go. Joseph Small, DeLuke shouted, front and center. Small marched to the front of the formation, turned and stood face to face with the lieutenant. Small, will you return to duty? No, sir, Small said. DeLuke glared at Small. Is that final? Yes, sir, that's final. Someone back in the ranks called out, If Small don't go, we won't go either. DeLuke's face flushed, blood red. He spun away from Small and marched off, leaving his division at the T in the road. Thanks.